Hey guys, I just wanted to apologize. This is a longer episode because we got into a really long talk about true love weights. So also take this as a content warning that if that kind of talk uh, upsets you at all, you might want to skip this episode. Thanks. Welcome to Your Music Saved Us, where two friends blast ourselves into the past to relive and recontextualize the alternative Christian music we grew up listening to in the 1990s. My name is Jay, and joining me is a man who has never been played like a deck of cards and never walks on pink and blue sidewalks, Clifton. (laughs) How are you, Clifton? Um, I'm I'm doing good, but I I probably have been played like a deck of cards before. I I don't know about the pink and blue sidewalk thing, but definitely been played like a deck of cards. All right, all right. Well, we'll get get to the pink and blue sidewalk (laughs) thing later. I have questions, but anyway. (laughs) um, Right. And Clifton, I know I usually ask you what we're listening to this week, um, but could we just mm-hmm. start without saying it and just play a little preview? I've got it right yep. here. Okay. Yep. Yep. Pocket change. Pocket change. Suck so and beat it up. So what? That isn't holy. Get yourself straight, man. You think you're okay just because you go to church on Sundays? Nuh uh. You're doing everything wrong. Do it right like I do. Uh, what? Where did that come from? Sorry, I, I'm just practicing to be a Christian punk. You don't know me! Why are you trying to oppress me? Gah! You just don't know! Why is everything so unfair? Um, who did you learn this from? Pocket Change. The, the real Pocket Change, though, not the one you played. Listen to their first album, Steadfast. Uh, oh, uh, do you want to talk about it? It seems like you've taken a lot of negative things from it. Yeah. Sometimes life seems so useless. Yeah, buddy, I know. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, pocket change. Um, Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. First of all, was this easy to find? Where were you able to to listen to this? Yeah, it's nowhere out there that I can find, at least. So, we put it on YouTube, including the hidden track. And um, obviously, there are lots of other pocket changes on Spotify, which is how we found yeah. uh, or how I found that song <laughs> to start with. So, you know, um, so how did we end up listening to this one? Yeah, so I wanted to listen to something that might be bad, but not just one of like the cheesy bands that everyone listened to or even a genre that I might be embarrassed to have dabbled my, into in my youth. And this seemed like a pretty good shot at that. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about Pocket Change. So Pocket Change formed around 1994 or 95 as a cover band. The members uh, for almost the entire run of the band were Tim Asimos on vocals and guitar. Although on this album, he he spelled his name T-I-M-M-E. I I don't know if that's Timmy or just Tim with more letters. Charlie Arnold on bass and backing vocals. And Brian Grover Saunders on drums. Um, At the time of this album was released, Tim was 18, Charlie was 17. They were both in high school still. And Brian was in college. I don't know what age age he was. Then according to an old Fortune City website on the Wayback Machine called Unleaded, the guys, quote, went to a strong arm show and decided to become a full-time Christian band, and we started writing our own music. Uh, The group was maybe signed in like mid-1996, it's hard to say, but they, quote, sent a demo tape to a recording company. <laughs> like, there isn't a lot of information out there on these guys. It's like two poorly written articles and a Wikipedia page that has way more information than is properly sourced. But according to Wikipedia, the band recorded Steadfast in August and December of 1996, which implies two recording sessions, August and December. And I think that kind of shows up in some of the songs. Uh, that album didn't hit store shelves until the fall of 1997. For some reason, Wikipedia just hints at multiple delays, but doesn't give any more information. And then kind of like we discussed with Quail, uh, these guys were in school at the time, so touring was tough, but they played on the weekends, and they did eventually tour for this album um, with Pep Squad over the summer of 1998. So in high school at the time, and I had to remind myself when I was listening to this <laughs> album that that was the case. And um yeah. I probably wouldn't be proud of things I produced in high school. I wasn't in a band, but you know, <laughs> just so I have to uh, just listener keep that in mind as we yeah. go through. You know, yes, very much so. <laughs> so, Clifton, tell us about memories you had with this. Like, when did this come into your life? Yeah, I don't, 
I don't remember specifically finding this album, but it had to have been right when it came out in the fall of 97. I remember really liking it at the time. And, you know, looking back on it, that was probably, probably part of that was just that this was a pop punk band that we found from the time they showed up on the scene. Plus, it wasn't like spoon fed to us by Tooth and Nail. I also liked kind of the uh, in your face lyrics. I thought these guys were really committed to God because all their songs are about Christian stuff. And that's something we'll be looking at as we discuss the album, I think. So any particular fond memories with this? <laughs> so I remember very vividly, uh, I remember listening to this at my friend, Al- friend Stewart's house, but not in his room like we often did. For some reason, we were listening to this in the living room on his parents' sound system. Yes, a sound system, people. A sound system, not a CD <laughs> right. player. Um, I don't think they were home when we started listening to it, so they probably came home somewhere along the way. And in the last song, Tim, Tim says that something sucks. And I remember that we got a very big lecture from Stuart's mom about how that language was inappropriate and we shouldn't be listening to music like this. And we tried to explain to her that this is a, God, this is a Christian band and that he was saying that something ungodly sucks and she was having none of that explanation. I think she told Stuart to get rid of the album, but I'm pretty sure he didn't. Uh, and how many of us had albums we were told to get rid of, but we didn't? <laughs> yeah, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Any songs stand out kind of that you remembered before you listened to it again? Yeah, you know, I remembered there being something about a pink sidewalk chalk or something like that just before I even picked up the album, but that was about it. Um, when I started listening to it, though, a lot of this came back. And, you know, I, I didn't listen to this as much as probably MXPX or Slick Shoes, but I listened to this album a lot at the time. So did you, could you even remember lyrics and stuff? When it... Yeah, not, not like full songs with the lyrics, but, you know, lines and stuff, yeah. Well, you kind of addressed this before, but any expectations, you know, before you put this on again? <laughs> so, like I said, I, I picked this because I thought it might not stand the test of time. I thought it would have bad recording quality or be poorly produced. I had a pretty good idea that the songwriting was going to be bad. And so I was, I was braced when I turned it on. I, I will say it did sound better than I thought it would, but it still has a lot of flaws to talk about. Well... Let's jump so, into it. Well, Jay, you had no experience with this at the time, Yeah, right? sorry. Um, it, it, I, I remember seeing this album. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, I remember looking at it and going, just from the cover art and thinking, that doesn't look very good. <laughs> and I passed on it. Prob- Without listening to it. I, I don't know why I didn't. It probably if it had come out like a year earlier, I would have. I feel like at this point, because this was 97, right, when it got mm-hmm. released? Late 97. I was probably moving more into like emo and some of that kind mm-hmm. of stuff and less straight up um, yeah. punk rock. Yeah, th- this is one of the last new punk bands I listened to in high school, I would say. Like, you know, I, I still listen to other bands that put out additional albums, but this is the last one of the, one of the last bands that I think I've specifically you know became a fan of there was noggin toboggan after this which didn't come out to 99 that was a i think a particularly good album for for what it was but i think this was one of the last ones yeah yeah it was all new to me so let's jump into it and uh (laughs) and talk about it all right so the first song played like a deck of cards so the the album starts off with 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 like just a guitar going through a four chord power chord structure that pretty much will be the staple of this entire album the first thing that hit me is that the guitar is a lot crunchier than most christian bands of the time which is to say it's not not as smooth sounding giving pocket change kind of more of a raw sound and that's probably honestly where a lot of my idea that it wasn't as well recorded as the other big names came from. And when I first listened to this album again the other day, I thought to myself, why does it, does it, does it, does it, does a guitar sound like this? I will say though, that on repeat listens, I kind of grew to like the crunchiness of the guitar, but then kind of with an ineffectual kind of fight, uh, the rest of the band comes in and the drums uh, really set the pace for the album, which is fast, but for some reason never really seems fast enough. I, I don't know why, but I, I think to, to some extent the drums seem kind of kind of hectic. <laughs> yeah, like I, I'm going to agree with you there. 
like a couple things I noticed this album. One, yeah, it's like the drums aren't fast enough. He doesn't really do that kind of like double bass kind of like yeah. punk or like skate punk type of drumming that you is pretty standard mm-hmm. with bands at the time. Another thing, I, and I don't know if you noticed this, I feel like the, and I can't believe I'm saying this, I feel like the drums are too loud on this album, like, all the <laughs> way through. Like, I hear them too much. I, I don't yeah. know. And also the, the the treble, like, the cymbals especially, I hear way more in the mix than I feel like I should. Really? Because I, I feel like there's no cymbals in this album. Like, there very rarely are. And what is loud is the snare and it's way too trouble. Maybe, maybe that's it. Like I seriously, I, I put this on and then I went back and played old MXPX, mm-hmm. early slick shoes, early value pack, early go to hook, anything that had come out before this. Yeah. Thinking that these guys had obviously probably listened to it and was just trying to figure out why do I not, I did not like the way this sounded. Just, just the sound of it, like the recording quality of it the whole way yeah. through. And I don't get it because Steve Griffith, produced this who ironically just did the audio adrenaline (laughs) album on our last episode and that doesn't sound bad i mean i know they didn't really have live drums much on that album which is a different thing but he he also he also did their next album which sound better i went and listened to that and and it sounded better mix and he produced the choir in the 77s i mean there's no reason yeah i I was struggling with the sound on this album. It just doesn't sound as good as it should with a producer yes. like that. I agree. But anyway, we're getting off track with the song. Sorry, I took Well, because I, I want to say one more thing about the drums because, like, okay, so the way you play snare especially is, and you know this, Jay, you're a drummer or you have drummed, that you hold this, the, the, the drumstick between your fingers and you kind of let the, the, the drumstick balance off the, off the snare. But what I feel like he's doing is, you know, those uh, monkey d- like 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 uh, toy things that hold hold the drumstick in their fist, and they're just like da 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 da. That's how I feel the drum the the, the snares on this because it's just like da 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 da, and it's awkward and it's weird. I don't know, and it's too loud. But it's the only part of the drums that are too loud, really. I don't, I don't know. The whole recording of the drums is weird. Well, and I know you have a theory about the the recording of this album with two parts. And um, I, I'm just <laughs> yes. going to go out and say, I think this was one of the first songs they recorded. Be- I agree. Because <laughs> some of the other ones yes. I think are better, you know, and, and yes. the drumming's oh, yes. better yeah. and everything. Yeah. But I will say that even with that, this isn't the worst drumming on the album by far, but it's one of the better drummings on the album because it's not as bad as some of the songs in the middle, which are nothing but the da 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 of the... Of the snare. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we'll move on. Tim's vocals comes in, of course, and I think Tim has a good but not great tenor vocals. He has kind of a somewhat interesting kind of slurring, nasally thing going on that kind of works. But really, overall, they're just very MXPX with hints of slick shoe thrown in now again. Thank you. I immediately thought my Carrera when yeah. it came on. Like immediately, I was like, "Oh my gosh, he's trying to sound exactly yes. like him." A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With it, without doubt, they're. I don't think they can get past that on this album. Right. That they're just trying to sound like 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 MXPX, and not only MXPX, but I think very specifically teenage politics. See, like I was maybe thinking, there's a little bit of Poconacci in there. Yeah, that's what I was thinking the first album, Poconacci, a little bit. Really? Because I think I think I think there's a late, well, lot more teenage politics in here as far as the vocals go. Well, but, both of those and both those albums were out before they recorded this, so yes. you know it, it's yeah. early MXPX for sure. So about the most interesting thing that happens in, in this song musically is that the guitar drops out and the bass drops out, and we get kind of a three beat cha 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 from the hi hat from the drummer. Which is saying a lot for the drummer because he didn't, he didn't, he didn't like, like it was snare and bass 90% of the time on this and not like fills or anything, just snare and bass. Da, 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 da. Anyways, yeah. <sighs> so that was, that was the, that was the interesting thing on this song, which is kind of going to be true throughout this album in that, like, I feel like they picked one interesting thing to do on every song. But Clifton, you're, you're leaving out the lyrics, the most interesting part. 
Yeah, okay, let's talk about them then, because because <laughs> the lyrics are interesting. <laughs> so these lyrics are, in my opinion, insane. <laughs> that they, they seem to depict an authoritarian America in which some force has the power to force everyone to choose what we do with our lives and to censor us and all. Okay, let me just read some lyrics here. The first line is, you call this freedom and democracy. You tell us what to do and just who to be. You censor, which by the way, in the lyrics are spelled with an S. You censor our mouths just because you don't believe. Our rights are taken away. What happened to G.O.D.? You've taken away the truth and filled it with lies. What happened to America? Why ain't it the same? This is so messed up. Why can't I say Christ's name? And and this is not some like... (laughs) You know, the first line you call this freedom and democracy. This is not some punk critique of like the government being bought off by corporate interest or something. This is literally the government is too authoritarian and telling us what to do and believe. Yes. And it's remember 1997 when they're doing this. 96. But 96 when it was recorded. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and as far as I'm concerned, that is honestly, that's what I was being taught from the pulpit uh, about the world that we lived in back in the mid nineties. I like Jay, was that your experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were the persecuted minority yeah. in America, the only ones standing <laughs> up for beliefs. I mean, yeah, it's just crazy when you think about it now, right? But yeah. that was kind of the, oh, yeah. the message. And I remember as a 16-year-old in youth group, we were told stories about Christians in communist China holding secret meetings that would be raided by heavily armed stormtroopers that would demand that everyone there denounce Jesus or be executed immediately. Yep. You know, and we would be told that any day we'd be forced We'd be facing the same thing here and that we need to make our minds, make up our minds right now about whether or not we're going to denounce Jesus Christ or die for him. Um, Like we were literally told to close our eyes and imagine that happening right now. Uh Uh-huh. Exactly. Uh, Do you remember the the wonderful Ray Bolt song, I Pledge Allegiance to the Lamb? Mm, No. I'm pretty sure that may be the video where there is kind of this like, futuristic dystopian america where these people have to like <laughs> declare their you know basically say that they're not believers and they refuse to so they're like snatched up and taken to be executed mm-hmm. and so this is a christian music video um maybe we should yeah. do a, maybe we should do a short episode just on that on yeah i'm gonna have to make video. sure that's the right one but um i'm pretty okay. sure that that's it so okay yeah and yeah you know, and so in reality, in the mid '90s, there was still backlash from the 1962 Supreme Court uh, decision that school-led prayer violates the Establishment Clause, and that was kind of a pot that had recently been stirred again by the 1992 Supreme Court decision that held on top of that that the official-led prayer at school events like graduation also violated the Establishment Clause. So. This, the 1992 decision specifically discussed how any prayer would necessarily reinforce the religious beliefs of some while excluding others, even within the Christian faith. You know, a Baptist prayer isn't going to be like a, a Catholic prayer, for example. And a Lutheran prayer, obviously, is going to sound nothing like a Muslim prayer. But if you really think about it, a public prayer is always going to offend, I, I should say it's always going to offend somebody, but it, it should offend anyone who follows the actual teachings of Jesus Christ because he specifically gave instructions not to pray on the street corners like a Pharisee, but to glow, go to a closet and to pray to God. So why are Christians so upset that they can't break Jesus' command? Yep. I don't understand it. <laughs> I know. I know. And, you know, Christians held such a place of privilege that when, when they were told they could no longer force their beliefs on others, basically they, they acted as if the, their fundamental rights had been stripped from them, like it was their right to force other people to pray like them. Um, and I think, and, and that's kind of what we see here. And, you know, this, this, this rhetoric has a, 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 not a long history, especially in the 90s. It has a long history today, I think, because it started back in the, in the early 70s with, uh, with the moral majority. Well, I mean, if you really think about it, the moral majority is kind of where the whole idea of evangelical Christianity came from. And it's, that whole culture was built on this, this rhetoric that, that Christians are being silenced and stripped of their rights to even talk about God. That's, that is where evangelical Christianity came from. You know, and, and to go back to a line from the song, our rights are taken, what happened to G-O-T, G-O-D, this is so messed up, why can't I say Christ's name? You tell us what to do and just who to be. And all of that, just because the Supreme Court basically upheld the rights of minorities not to have religion, other people's religions forced upon them. Yeah, like, we don't have, like, a state-sponsored church 
you know, like they do what? in England. Like right. but there's a reason for that. And and I've always thought with this stuff, like how would these same people feel if it, this was like a Muslim majority country, you know, like they right. certainly wouldn't want like that kind of thing dictated to them through the government. So why are they so upset about this? It's just. Yeah, a hundred percent. But I don't think, I don't think you have to go that far. Like what if it was a Catholic majority country and they were Baptists? Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, they you know, I mean, too, that's, yeah. there have been wars. There were, there have been many wars fought just between Catholics and Baptists. Do we, is that really what we want here? I don't know. Anyways. Yeah. Uh, let's get back to pocket change a little bit, because I think I want to say that this, to an extent, isn't them saying this, because they're just stupid kids, I think, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, these are, we probably would have said the same thing, right? This is oh, just, 100%. you're just parroting what you hear yes. in church, and that's that, because that the whole culture at the time mm -hmm. really had this idea, you know? Yeah, it was it was just it it was preached so often that it just became part of who you were to be this victim. Right. And I say that because these guys went to a Christian school, a private Christian high school. So even if for some reason this was more than just being preached at you and if if you know, if, if it was possible that someone encountered this, it wasn't them. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, it was like um, the outside yeah. society that they're not really a part of anyway. Yeah. And and I say that as someone that went to a public school, but it was the same idea. I was never really challenged. Right. No, me either. This. I wasn't persecuted, but you were always taught that it's right around the corner. You know? mm, yes. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I think part of what's hard to grapple with here for me is that, you know, these are kind of just the ramblings of kids who've never faced the slightest adversity in their lives, you know, kind of just parenting what they're told by irresponsible and childish adults, honestly. But at the same time, that, when that makes the leap from just happening in a youth group to being recorded on an album that's sent out for a bunch of youth to listen to, there's some response. Someone has responsibility there. I don't know who it is. I don't know if it's pocket change. I don't know if it's the the record label. I don't know if it's the people who taught them. But but it becomes it becomes dangerous at that point. I think. Well, this album does a good job of kind of showing that cycle, right? Of these beliefs that. Mm -hmm. You know, get birth one place, get repeated enough within the culture, and it's now coming out mm -hmm. on this like Christian punk album, right? But it's basically the same beliefs that you would hear on any other style of music, or just in a if you picked up a random book off the Christian bookstore back in <laughs> 1996 on the shelf, like it's the same kind of ideas coming through. Yes, and very much so, which we'll see throughout throughout talking about this album because this album is probably 90 percent just repeating things that are taught in youth. Yeah. <laughs> good, good yeah. point. You know, while that rhetoric gained so much strength in the 1990s about Christians being silenced and persecuted for their faith, it's alive and well today. And, and honestly, it's in my opinion, it's why conservative Christians are such strong supporters of Trump. They don't care about him. They just want judges in the federal courts and justices on the Supreme court that agree with them so that they'll never have to share the public space. And this is, this is, this is important that, they justify that through themselves by by uh, by erecting this persecution narrative for themselves, and it's dangerous. You know, they've convinced themselves that they're the victim of, victims of like unspeakable violence and oppression, and their rhetoric rhetoric honestly has been built in almost like a tinderbox under the fabric of our society. And anyone who looks at this should be rightly terrified that it could burst into flames at any minute. Yeah, and I think they also, they justify it by saying, well, we're a Christian nation, and there's all this kind of like revisionist yeah. history that has come along in the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years that kind of yeah. tries to justify that. I remember we had a guy, and he's actually pretty big now, named David Barton, with a oh, group yeah. called the Wall Builders, come to our church in like the 80s oh, or really? 90s, and it was like this idea of, <laughs> it's a Christian nation, he had, I think he had this book called The Bulletproof George Washington, and just talked mm -hmm. about like, our country was founded on God, our country is different. And so if you believe that, then of course you believe you need to stack the court system with these certain type of judges right. and all these other things, because you're just bringing the country back to the way it was. And these godless liberals or whatever, you know, are trying to make it really bad and change everything. And that's, yeah, how we get here. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it, it's hard to have disagreements with people when there's a disagreement about literal reality. Yeah. <laughs> true you know and when when people like david barton step in and try to rewrite that reality it's it, you, you you're just poisoning all of society 
And because the only way back from that is for them to give up this persecution narrative, which will, which will have to go back to them giving up the idea that this, this is a Christian nation. And it's just, I don't have high hopes for how this ends. <laughs> yeah. Whew. Uh, you want to go into the next song then? <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Um, I, don't, I don't really want to talk about uh, Good Feeling. I do just, uh, you know, I think a lot of, some people consider it one of the better songs on the album. I, I just want to say once again, this, it stands out to me as one of like the more MXPX Teenage Politics songs on the album. It's just, it, it, you could almost just replace the who's singing and the who's playing stuff like just and put it on and it would be an okay song on Teenage Politics, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about once a week. Yeah. So this song starts off with like some palm muting, which is going to be the interesting thing that they do on this song. And and it's not bad, you know. Uh, you know, you, you basically start with some, this palm with the palm muting. You, you know, you get some like drum rolls behind it. Before it once again goes into their patented four chord power power chords as fast as they can play them, which is not ever feel quite as fast as fast enough. The vocals in this one seem a little bit more slick shoesy to me than 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 MXPX at least for this song. Um, and and on this song and the, I think the previous song we start getting some double vocals on the chorus so that it's not just Tim singing singing. There aren't really any three-part harmonies on this album, which in a way kind of sets them apart from other Christian punk bands of the time, and another thing that makes them kind of feel more raw, but probably also makes you feel like you're missing something, um, and that the album is just like not well-produced or written or recorded or something like that as the other bands. Do you feel like this song was recorded in the second session, though? You know, I didn't go back and make an accounting of all the songs I thought were recorded in each session. I probably should have. To me, this one sounds better. It does sound better. I agree with that. I, I think that I think you could pick probably this song, the last song, the hidden track, and maybe one of the other songs towards the end, but not Pink Blue and Pink Sidewalk. Not that one because that one's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> that were that were that were in the second session. Yeah, he seems like a better drummer on this song too. Like it's a little faster. It's faster. Some yes. more fills with the toms and stuff. Like I feel like mm-hmm. this is you know a few months later. Yeah, and there's also two guitar parts in this song on this song, and and they didn't actually add a second guitarist until the very end of the band, right before they broke up. They didn't record anything. Well, I take it back. They they recorded a two song demo that no one's ever heard, um, with that setup. But I think I think one of the reasons this song works is because it does have the two guitar parts, and not they're not always they're not doing different things completely, but they're sometimes doing different things. And I think that for a band like this, I think that would have been a good choice for them to have second guitarist from the beginning. Yeah. Once again, though, let's talk about the lyrics, because that's what's really interesting about this album. <laughs> so, Jay, if I told you that a Christian band recorded a song called Once a Week without listening to it, what would you guess the song was about? Um, church. OK, OK. That was not what I thought. Oh, what did you think? <laughs> I thought this is going to be about someone who goes to church once a week and doesn't do Christian things the rest of the week. Oh, well, I said church. <laughs> well, yeah, but not just church. Church could be like, I go to church once a week and it's great. I don't know. Okay. All right. Got it. <laughs> so the first song that we talked about is a song about how Christians are being persecuted and you can't even talk about Jesus anymore. But then most of the songs in this album are about how other people aren't Christian and right, <laughs> which is an interesting juxtaposition, I guess, of, of the songs in that. A guy who just whined about being persecuted, even though it's not real, is going to literally start telling other people that they're doing everything wrong. Right. So let's get to some lyrics here. The first, I think this is the first verse. It's a never ending cycle. You think you're saved because you own a Bible. Can't you see it's not that way? You go to church on Sunday, but you're a different guy on Monday and every week is just the same. Sorry, that was the course. <sighs> and in the song before this, by the way, 
we get the lyrics. We didn't talk about the song, but it, it's also like it's also very similar. It says, "You say one thing, but another is what you do. You don't follow what he says, but whatever is good for you. There's only one side. You can't just be on both. You're killing your mind and you're stunting your Christian growth." Which is a very weird thing to say to somebody. Yeah. Hey, man, you're stunting your Christian growth. And, and what's that going to mean to someone that's not like a? I don't know. You you have to be in a yeah. certain world to even understand what that means. Also, can I don't think I can say that without sounding like an asshole. Like like an asshole. Like it, and it doesn't mean anything. It's just like <laughs> it's like the word synergy, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I know what he's trying to say, but just like say it like a human, not like a robot. Anyways, <laughs> did you feel like this song also slightly hints at the idea of like it might be more fun to not be a Christian type of thing? Oh like yeah. We saw in was it was it Newsboys that we were talking about that? Um, <laughs> because he says in the first verse, he says, "When your weekend's done, you're all messed up. You had too much fun. Get yeah, yourself too much straight fun. for the next day." Like you know, I guess you're hungover going to church or something, but it. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it kind of implies like, okay, being a Christian is not fun. It's a lot of work. Yeah. You got to buckle down. Stop yeah. doing this stuff. We got to we got to ration our fun here, yeah. guys. This isn't. Yeah, come on. Yes, there there is that implication to this song. Besides the complete artlessness of these lyrics, what jumps out at me is that there's nothing personal about them. Mm. Yeah, you know, maybe Tim looks at other people and judges them a lot, and maybe. That's personal, but there's nothing introspective about them. There's nothing that's like, let me look at me and see if I'm doing this also. Or there's nothing that says, hey, here's what I struggle with. There, there's one or two songs that will do that later on. And I honestly think that they're, those are the ones that are part of that second wave of songs. But this is one, th- one reason I don't know if this is part of that, fir- that second wave is because the lyrics are still very much this angry, hey, you're doing everything wrong. And it's not, there's no introspection involved in it. You're right. I, I hadn't put my finger on it, but there's very little just personal, <laughs> yeah. thing, like anything revealed pretty much throughout this whole thing. You're right. A couple songs, it's slightly better, but this is not a personal album at all. Yeah. And all the same, I loved it at the time. I thought it was really in your face. Word of God, punk rock, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it was it was easy to understand. It was easy to, you know, say you had those mm-hmm. beliefs. It made you feel strong and good about Thumping your own chest about, I believe this stuff. And (laughs) yeah, life was simple and easy. I think there's also, for at least for me, for why I liked it, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, kind of thinking the world isn't fair. You know, I don't go out on the weekends and drink and have sex, but the kids that do, you know, they look like they were having more fun than me. And sometimes they even had a better standing in the church. I follow the rules. Where's my reward? Where's my girlfriend? Mm, Which we'll come back to in a a couple songs here. (laughs) One of the notes I made here when my first listen through was, there's a lot of attitude on this album, but it's all bratty and condescending. Yeah. <laughs> you want to do the next song? My God. If you listen to this album back in the day, <laughs> you'll probably remember that this is a ska song. <laughs> and not a well done ska song. Yeah, my notes I wrote, is this ska? With a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, so there's something wrong with the upbeats. Right, yes. Which I might have to... <laughs> <laughs> the bass line is there, that's fine. Yes, right. So the bass is doing exactly what they're supposed to do, which is a walking bass line, right? But I feel like the the upbeats are like they go like da 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 da, and that part's fine. Then the da 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 kind of repeats like da da da, and that part's fine. The upbeats are on the upbeat, but then they just kind of then there's like another half to the to the guitar part. I feel like the upbeats are, they're no longer on the upbeats, they're on the downbeats then. Yeah, it's weird. It's a very clumsy, awkward song. Immediately after, after the lyrics are exhausted on this, on this song, well, here, let, let me just give you my notes. We get a drum and brace break da- breakdown, and then, oh, shit, is that a horn? One single horn! <laughs>
But that horn does the same thing as the verse vocals. There could have just been another verse there because it, it's, it's the, I don't know. Yeah. I hope they don't do another ska song because they won't have any tricks left. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. This is weird. I'm not sure why it's on here. Um. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we could talk about the lyrics, but they're not interesting. Well, I, I mean, if I, yeah, if I can for a second, I just noted this is just a great collection of Christian cliches. And if I could read a yeah. few to you, these are the lines. How great is your name? You'll always be the same. Lord, you are so great. You gave your life on a tree. You took my sin away from me. I mean, these are just like straight, just, mm -hmm. you know, take them out of Sunday school type lines. Yeah. Nothing interesting about what's going on here. Right. The only thing that makes this song interesting, I think, because in the end, it's not a horrible song. If the upbeat things annoys you, you will have to turn it off. But I think his vocals are just interesting enough that it rescues the song. Yeah. What do you think about his vocals, by the way? He tries to sound too much like Mike Herrera. Yes. And I feel like there's moments when he breaks away from that that's better. Yeah. And I jumped ahead and listened to the second album a little more, and I thought it sounded oh, really? a lot better. Like, Was it available somewhere? Uh, there's a few songs on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, and so I thought it was better there. It's just like he, he's kind of putting that nasalness into it sometimes when I don't feel like he needs it. Yeah. He's also kind of monotone. Yeah. And as someone who grew up liking punk and indie rock, there's a way to not be able to sing and still have it work. Right. You know? But for some reason on this one, I don't feel like it works as well. No. Like maybe they needed to do some retakes on some of the songs or something. I don't know. Yeah. It just. Well, and I think it has a lot to do with songwriting in that you can write songs in such, in such a way that you not being able to sing doesn't matter. Yeah. But I think they're trying too much to sound like MXPX that they aren't writing songs that complement their own talents. And I get the sense with him, he can actually probably sing better than this, but he's trying to sound. You think way. so? I, I might be wrong. I don't know, you know, but huh. that's kind of what I take from it. Okay. Interesting. I did not get that feeling. Well, yeah, you may be right. But let's move on to number track number seven for me. Listen to this song, especially on the back of the previous songs, which were all pretty bad. <laughs> it got me to thinking that one of the kind of like the original aesthetic of punk rock, especially American punk rock like the Ramones, is, you know, the DIY, anyone can do this music-making thing attitude. Right. You just get some friends, you get some instruments, and you write some songs. Yeah. And then you listen to an album like this, and, you know, especially a song like this song or the one before it, and you think, you know what? No. Some people shouldn't do the songwriting thing because they just repeat the same un uninteresting thing over and over again and without changing and... You know, your hope for music and your hope for the world kind of melts away into the salt-covered flatlands of windswept erosion. And like all the curses that you can yell at the top of your lungs are just like sucked into the void and silenced. And you wonder if you should like just give up on life. <laughs> um, can I pull you back into this? <laughs> <laughs> and, and just before we talk more about it, I mean, just to, to defend pocket change slightly and i don't know why because i didn't have any attachment to this band <laughs> growing up but i feel like this is an album that was put out too soon like they should have yeah. matured more as a band before they put mm -hmm. out an album you know yes. and again i didn't really study the songwriting on the next album and i don't have it to look at the lyrics but i'm assuming yeah. it was better it had to have been it really couldn't have yeah. gotten any worse yeah i agree and let, let, i want to talk about that especially the last song because <laughs> Uh, one of my notes on this song is I'm so glad that they that the, uh, that the songs on this album are in the same order that, that they wrote them in so that we can see them grow as songwriters over the course of the album. <laughs> <sighs> oh, well, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about this one then. I don't say this is the seventh. Hey. Uh, no, I don't know. Anyway. It's better than the two songs before this. Could, maybe. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. So the intro is just some like fast moving drums with some quick power chords like duh. Duh, and the jump like, duh, 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 you know. And then they go into their power chord thing, and you know, the this is when it really hit me that the drummer must have one hand, and he just like <laughs> fisting the 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 snare. 
And it really just annoyed the crowd. Like, I, I had to step away for a moment at this point in the album. There's no flourish. There's no, there's nothing interesting going on here. I, I mentioned in the first couple songs that, hey, here's the interesting thing they're doing on this song. At the, in this middle part of the album, it's nothing. They're not doing anything interesting on any of the songs. Unless you want to count the ska, like... <sighs> The ska bridge thing on this song that's kind of slower. I don't know. <laughs> but the lyrics, Clifton, the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about the lyrics because they are. Okay, before we talk about the lyrics, all of them, like in general, can we talk about one song in particular or one line in particular? Sure. Got that feeling in my tum. <laughs> Does he say tum or tummy? Because in the in the lyric book, it's spelled T U M I. <laughs> is it say M I or is it M apostrophe with with because all the eyes look like uh, all the apostrophes look like eyes? You're in the notes? right. That's what it is. Uh, in this song, for some reason, oh maybe throughout the whole book, yeah, all the apostrophes the whole look book. like a, they look like an apostrophe with an I below them. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about that when we talk about the, the packaging. I was yeah, I was but, just, okay, okay. So it is yeah. Tom with like an because he's got he's got a rhyme. He, I forget what he was rhyming with, but just oh, my I know God, that day will come. Is. I've got that feeling oh, in yeah. my tum. <sighs> <laughs> come on, guys, <Okay>. come on. <laughs> so these lyrics are well. Let me let me do this in the right this in my my thought here in the right voice. These lyrics are certified one hundred percent cringe by the Toxic Middle Council. <laughs> yeah i'm a cringe just all cringe yeah i'm I'm a little reminded of she dreams of me by the mer babies just the uh-huh. same kind of idea i feel like well i like the mer babies more so i feel like this one is worse maybe that's not fair to this say, one is worse but this one is worse there's yeah. more lyrics to this one the mer babies don't have <laughs> they don't say as much but yeah so this song is about how he knows that god's going to give him a girlfriend because that is just that's just part of god's perfect plan but what about these lyrics would make you think that this guy deserves or is ready to have a woman in his life? <laughs> yeah, I would posit that they do the exact opposite. <laughs> you know, I don't know that I can blame Tim for this completely. Honestly, this is how I felt at the time. Yeah, yeah, me too. And it's a, I think it's entirely a reflection of what we were being taught in youth group and especially through True Love Waits. Yep. And it's kind of a recipe for disaster. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you, Jay, but I will say without a doubt, without even getting into the things that we need to confess in small group, I don't, I don't remember times in high school when I felt so lonely as during or after a True Love Waits retreat. Mm, good point. Because I want to do, okay, so first, you know, teens are stupid and they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what's going on with them in the world. I'll say that's especially true of like us middle class white sheltered evangelical teens in the mid in the mid nineties. And you know, second, we've all got hormones raging through us that make us want to fall in love and make us horny and make us want to start a life and all these kinds of things. And we think that we're gonna meet someone and fall in love and be in love forever. And so for that, I can kind of forgive Tim for these lyrics. But at the same time, none of those things are really allowed. You know, societally, you know, the the kids of that age, us back then, we were too young to really engage in any of that. And the church completely disallowed and really shamed, you know, any kind of sexual sexual expression. And it also preached, I don't don't know about you, but uh, but our our true love weights, they spent a lot of time preaching against, quote unquote, plain house. Oh, I've never, what do you mean? I haven't heard that. (laughs) That would be something like, you know, don't cook for each other. Wait, what? Yeah, because it, because it, it forms too much of an emotional bond. Oh, so like while you're dating, don't yes. don't actually do nice things for each. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> okay. I don't know that it was so much nice things, but it was just anything that I think most people would consider relationshipy. Right. Was discouraged. 
because it would it would be too much of an emotional attachment. And you need to avoid those emotional attachments because you're probably not going to marry this person because you're in high school. And so if you get if you get attached to someone, you're going to get hurt. And if you get hurt, that means that your future spouse is now denied a part of you because you got hurt. Yeah. Which is very weird. So so now I want to dive into this culture, this kind of true love weights. And, and you know, we've, 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 cause we've talked about, um, I kissed dating goodbye before, but that would, for me, that was later on. Yeah. True love way started in 1993 and it hit us in 93. So 93 was when we were starting junior high. Well, I think, I, I think 90, 92, 93 was my first year of junior high. I assume that was your, yep. your first year yep. of junior high. Yeah. So we were kind of like, we were kind of the first group of kids that got their entire youth group was from year one to year six was all true love weights for the whole time. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. So a little bit of backstory, true love weights formed in 1993 out of kind of uh, this, you know, purity culture, this idea that, that sex rates had been sex rates among teens had been going up in the late eighties and early nineties, as well as teenage pregnancy and STDs and things like that. STIs, I guess is the way we say it today. True Love Weights wanted to form kind of a, uh, I'm going to say a marketable program that catered to people on, or catered to teens about how to do this whole dating relationship thing while being in God's will. A lot of it was just, well, I'm going to get down to it. True Love Weights, what does that mean? That's sex. Right. We don't have sex until we're married. (sighs) Sorry, this is kind of hard. It's kind of hard to talk about this. It's, 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 it's It's like separated from who I am right now but also like such a huge part of who I was back then, right? It's this very weird thing. And, and, and True Love Weights was often taught at, the, at, at like weekend retreats. Is that how you usually experienced it? Yeah, I, I feel like there was kind of a, it wasn't something to just unpack one night at youth group. It was like a bigger right. type thing. Yeah. We would, always, we, we would always go to like a weekend retreat to, there was like a, a place where like the, the children's camp was held there during the summer. Um, it was pretty close to my hometown. We, we would go there for the long, for a weekend, maybe on a long weekend and, you know, have talks and stuff. And, and they would, you know, basically tell you about how if you have sex, you're going to get pregnant or the girl's going to get pregnant, you know. And if you have sex, you're, you're not going to be as going to be as good a partner for your uh, spouse later on. I, I, I did a lot of research about this. I actually listened to a book uh, yesterday about kind of the purity culture that, that kind of focused on true love weights. And I didn't experience this in high school, but they said a lot of people would use and maybe I did and I just blocked it out but a lot of people would use metaphors like they would they would pass around an Oreo cookie and everyone would touch it and take it apart and put it back together and all kinds of stuff and like to a whole group and then you know when it got back to the front they would say now who wants to eat this cookie right that's what happens to you when you have sex with other people <laughs> like having sex makes you into some dirty you know gross thing <laughs> Now let's talk about the things that you do have to, re- to, to, to uh, confess to in small group. Along with being lonely, I definitely never looked at girls as much as I did at, at these, at the, at these uh, getaways. <laughs> right. And right after. But they're completely unsuccessful. Well, I actually have some stats here. And this is from an article in, in The Guardian. The, the Guardian is going to quote here a study from the Journal of Adolescent Health. This is a 2001 study. 88% of purity pledgers had premarital intercourse. And by the way, that's the same number as... People who didn't take purity pledges. <laughs> so people who took purity pledges have the same sexual, um, they still have sex. The one thing they did do is they, put, they, they typically put it off by another year or so. They, they just waited one more year to have sex. But for people who took purity pledges, when they did have sex, they were one third less likely to use protection. They were more likely to get, um, they're slightly more likely to get STDs and slightly more likely to get pregnant. I, I mean, that fits with my obviously very limited experience from what I saw yeah. in youth group too, is like definitely some people that got pregnant in high school. Um, because <laughs> really? why, in your youth group? Uh, yeah. Like, and why would yeah. you use, why are you going to use a condom or protection when you're told that, you know, you shouldn't be doing that in the first place. So like, if you right. have, if you, you know, preemptively have one of those things, that means you're, mm-hmm. you're already thinking about sinning and it's just, right. <laughs> if you plan it far enough ahead to have a condom, that means you plan to have sex. Right. So the only way to have sex is the most dangerous sex that you can have. Yep, exactly. Which is either sex without a condom or even worse, something that kind of arose, I think, towards the end of our experience in high school and kind of after us, 
was a big move towards the towards people having anal intercourse. Oh my god! Which is more dangerous. If you already have an STD, it's easier to spread S- STI. Sorry, through anal sex than it is through vaginal sex. I do remember, and I can't remember if it was a joke, but somebody, not necessarily in youth group, but one of the people that I knew from that, like talking about anal sex yeah. and how maybe that wasn't considered like, oh yeah, real sex. I mean. <laughs> Definitely in our small group time, we spent more time discussing, okay, what can you do? Right. (laughs) Because here's the thing. Kids have, it's not their fault. They have so many hormones running through them. (laughs) Yeah. That are all, that are, that are, it's not just making them horny. They, they, that, that it, this has a purpose, right? I mean, it's, it's there because that's how we reproduce as a species. (laughs) And, you know, these hormones are meant to make them want to get to know people, to fall in love, to have sex, to to spend time together. And these are very natural expressions of caring for someone and loving someone, right? So the the, the book I listened to yesterday, it's called Pure, Inside the Evangelical Mu- Movement that Shamed a Generation of Young Women and How I Broke Free by Linda K. Klein. And this is specifically talking about women because I, 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 I have plenty of experience from being a male and going through this. And I kind of wanted to see what the experience was from a female, from the female side. And, you know, I think it was really hard on us, which was nothing compared to what women went through. Because they were basically told, like, like, as guys, we were told, hey, you can't really stop yourself from looking at women, but you should try. Right. And women were told, guys are helpless. You're the stumbling block. Yep. Which turns them into a thing. Mm -hmm. Just a a, a physical, nothing more than a physical thing for, for men to look at. And that men can't help themselves. I don't know about your experience, but I'll share a little bit of my experience uh, for me personally. You know, when I finally, so I didn't have a girlfriend through through most of high school until the very end of my senior year. And when I finally did get a girlfriend, I, I, I remember being devastated when we quote unquote went too far, which is like touching each other. Right. I felt like I had failed her, like I had tempted her, like I spoiled her so that she wouldn't be any good for her husband, you know, like I would, like I would literally not talk to her for a, for a day or two. And, and I remember that she told me more than once, it takes two to tango. She was way more mature than I was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but even then, I, I, I can say honestly that it took me literally years to truly believe that women are interested in sex. Um, you know, because we're just so indoctrinated into this idea that men are predators of women and that it's our responsibility to protect them from ourselves and from other men. But their responsibility is not to tempt us by wearing the wrong thing or to look at us the wrong way, you know? (laughs) And it's just, I don't know. It's just, it's all gross. Yeah. You know, to, to bring it back to pocket change, (laughs) Yeah, not them specifically, but like kind of what you're seeing in the song is, um, you got to save yourself because there is one for you out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so you got to make sure everything is perfect for her. And uh, yeah, there's just, you did a good job of talking about true love weights. There's so many levels though, of like just problems Mm -hmm. with this, you know, from, from the sexual stuff, just to the, also like the idea of a one that you're waiting for, Mm -hmm. which is completely bogus and just like, Oh my gosh. It's just, yeah. you know, you, you're thinking back on some of these, like, I, I'm just going to label it youth group stuff that we learned and good God, how much it probably set us back, you know? And at the time you're like looking at the people that weren't in youth group and thinking like, Oh, how lost they are. But like, mm-hmm. geez, they were probably much <laughs> more like emotionally healthy than all yes, of us that yeah. were in youth group. Yeah. I mean, this barely scratches the surface, you know, I, I also remember, over and over again, like not even pursuing, you know, relationships because, you know, you're told in true love weights that, you know, hey, if you can't even, you know, not if you if you can't even stop yourself from having pure thoughts with a girl, what's going to stop you from touching her when you do date her, you know? And so it's like, well, I guess I shouldn't date anyone. Yeah. But it definitely kept me from trying for a long time. I remember I read a, and I wish I didn't remember the name of this book, but I read a book after I had graduated college, just a year mm-hmm. or two after. 
this is how kind of like immature I was on these things. It kind of blew my mind because it was basically the opposite of I kiss dating goodbye and kind of advocating for dating. Mm -hmm. And it basically was just saying, you know, you've been waiting for the one and you, this person is not just going to fall into your lap. Like you (laughs) actually have to go out and talk to people, do this stuff. And I felt like my mind was blown at the time because I just grown up so long thinking that there is just this one and God will bring into Mm -hmm. my life and I just have to wait. And it was not, yeah. I mean, I seven, eight yeah. years I've been believing that, and I finally was like, <laughs> oh, I actually take some initiative on my part to actually right. do this. I mean, it sounds stupid saying it out loud, but that's basically what I believe. <laughs> and, and, you know, another side of this is that one of the promises of True Love Waits was that, and I should say is, because it's still growing strong, by the way, people. Wow. It's still being taught in youth groups. And one, one, of, the, one of the promises of True Love Waits was, or is that, if you if you don't have sex, if you save yourself until marriage, that you're going to get married one day, and your first kiss is going to be with your with your with your spouse, and you're going to go have just this amazing wedding night with the most amazing thing like sex that you like just blow your mind sex right. But this book that I listened to yesterday was just filled with stories of women who <laughs> who got to their wedding nights and like they didn't know how to have sex and it was awkward and like several like just people who basically just gave up on sex for their entire lives because they never figured it out or they they just weren't compatible with they weren't sexually compatible with with their spouse you know which is a, which is one subject that I don't really want to even get into because I want to I want to back up on that one step and say back to this like don't play house thing is that that's how we learn like the reason that teenagers want to do that is because that that's how humans learn we learn what we don't like. We learn what we do like. We learn how to do it by trying things. And so dating very much is just a trial and error process of, of how does this work? What should I do? What should I not do? And not to say that it can't be toxic. Of course it can be. Of course it can be destructive. It can be hurtful. But for the most part, and especially if we're open with ourselves as a society and we actually talk to our kids about this. And by the way, another thing that came out of that book is that Almost no evangelical parents talk to their talk to their kids about sex, by the right. way, or dating. But if we actually had open conversations, of course people are going to still get hurt. Of course there's going to be bad relationships. There's going to be, but those scars are fine too. Those scars from being hurt are fine too. That that's part of that's part of the beauty of life is to, is to have been hurt and to get better and to move on. And you know, so this this idea that the only way to leave a godly life is to not get hurt is is a ridiculous idea. Right. That's how we learn. There is actually one other point I wanted to make that kind of goes along with this is that I don't think that it's any accident that neither person in this narrative has any character. I mean, you could you could chalk it up to his, just his bad writing throughout this album, <laughs> but there's no character to any either of these person, people. And I think that kind of has to do with an unspoken thing here, which is that this is just somebody who wants to want somebody and who wants to be wanted. It's not someone who's really looking for a relationship. It's not yeah. someone who's, who's in love with a girl, you know? That's a great point. It, I was just going to say, I think... I think we're going to see this in some other albums because I kind of remember this idea of like, it's not a specific girl you have in mind, but because that, that idea of having a girlfriend and relationship is out there, Mm -hmm. but you're in this kind of Christian culture, you just long for that, not a specific person, just you want that. And I think we'll probably see this idea more when we go through other albums for sure. Yeah. And I, I just want to tie it back to that loneliness thing, you know, because when you're promised the perfect person to like compliment you and the per- perfect person to be your your mate and your best friend, basically, and then to just, to just be told, but, you know, wait five to 10 years. Yeah. You know, preferably until you have a university education. That's just how do you tell it to a 16 year old? <laughs> right. We're going to skip over rest assured and behind a wall. But I do want to mention that these are the two most boring songs of this album. So much so that I ended up writing notes to myself like, that was a really great show, guys. If you keep playing together and writing songs, you might be able to headline a show at the VFW in a year or two. <laughs> there's just, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there's just such a huge chasm between the better songs in this album and the worst songs in this album. Yeah. Speaking of, let's talk about I Have Decided. Yeah, uh, this is a cover. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm, I'm going to be honest to you, Clifton, uh, I got about halfway through and then skipped it. <laughs> sure. Why not? It's not good. Yeah. So it's a cover <laughs> of the hymn I have decided if that, that's yeah, not clear right. to the listener. And when you think about it, like, 
could they have picked a more perfect hymn to cover for these guys? Like, you know, it's one of the simplest and most monotone hymns in the entire Baptist hymnal. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Yep. True. Oh, and this is one. This is this is my dad's favorite hymn. So, oh. yeah. because of that, I actually did kind of like it at the time. <laughs> Uh, I remember the na- the vocals were being super nasal. Like I felt like he was yeah. on purpose kind of doing that. Oh yes. Yeah. It is the most distinct on that song. Yeah. But I don't feel like, I feel like it's so far that it doesn't sound like my career at all. This one, not as much. Yeah. All right. Comfort zone. This is another one where my first note is just like teenage politics, especially the vocals. This is just a teenage politics song. That said, it's one of the few songs uh, that's actually not fast for being this, for the sake of being fast. But you can tell in this one that they actually just wrote a song that they enjoyed, not that they were just trying to play as fast as possible. And we, we have a first on this album, another first, because they only do one thing interesting at a time. Oh God, I want to know you. I'll live for you, I'll show you. Continue with prayer every day. backing vocals i wrote why are we hearing this just now for the first time on the 11th song guys these are the kind of things that you can use as tools so that not every moment is just like the one before (laughs) but this might be one of those second batch of songs this this is my this is one of my other contenders because the drums actually have like feels. It's not just da 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 da. There's actually like da 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 da. da you know, like like there's there's drum fills and stuff on it. Yeah. That's how I felt about um. What was the name of the song? Once a week earlier. Yeah. Okay. It seemed like it was a little more developed. At the end of the song, which is once again they kind of only do one interesting, one interesting thing at a time here. At the, at the end, at the end of the song, there is kind of this spiffy kind of palm muted breakdown, uh, that ends with kind of this "Oh, pick it up," which is very MXPX. <laughs> And then it kind of goes back to some like some he- heavy uh, cymbal crashing kind of stuff towards the end of the end of the song, kind of rocking out. And just with those, I think just those three things, drum fills, backing vocals, and a bridge breakdown that it, they didn't seem like they gave up on halfway through, make this is one of the better songs on the album. Right. <laughs> it would still be filler on Teenage Politics, but it's one of the better songs on this album. <laughs> and the lyrics kind of kind of reflect that a little bit too. And that this is one of the very few songs that I think gets personal a little bit. I mean, like... A little bit. It's still a little bit of a cliche, but okay. And it's, it's full of cliches. In fact, I went off on... This is the point at which I broke about cliches. First off, they say grief and strife. Mm. <laughs> I'm not going to read to you what I wrote in my notes. I would have to beep it all out. <laughs> and then they say continuing with prayer every day. I don't know. It's just... This whole album, as we've already talked about, this is when I broke and I just went on a tirade in my notes about it, that this album is just full of empty and rote repetition of aphorisms that are honestly an insult to the listeners. It's, and th- this isn't the worst of it. I mean, you've already brought up where, where we've had worse, you know? Yeah. But just 90% of the, album, the lyrics on this album are just, they're not remotely personal. They're, they're nothing more than, you know, regurgitation of youth group Bible study notes quickly jotted down in the margins of a study guide. There's nothing here that makes makes me think this actually means anything to the guys at all, except as a way to bash other people upside the head. And, you know, maybe as a simple outline to live their lives by so they don't actually have to discover something interesting or new. I, I don't know. It's just saying all that. I loved this at the time, but maybe I just loved being an ass at the time, too. Who knows? <laughs> let's let's move on. OK. Yeah. I mean, what are we on next? Blue and pink sidewalk, blue and pink sidewalk. Um, by the way, I will tell you, I have Googled this and um, I don't know what they mean uh, still. Do you, do you know what blue and pink sidewalk means? No. OK. And I, I like remember I read the lyrics multiple times. Like I was really trying yeah. to figure this out. I thought maybe there's something clever here, but based on the rest <laughs> of the album, I don't know. I remember at least I think I remember in high school trying to figure out what they meant here and actually coming to a conclusion. And I don't know. <laughs> I've looked at the lyrics again. I've read everything I can. Maybe I had an article available to me in high school that I don't have now that helped me to get to a conclusion, but I, I don't know 
Well, let's get back to that when we get into the, into the lyrics, okay. though. Let me sum this song up for you. You don't know me! You don't know me! So that's not fair! Why does it matter? How we sing or what I wear? All that matters is my belief. My God is awesome! Hell ever late! Don't try to judge me with a stupid mind! It's not the outside, but what's inside? Which, by the way, that sounded exactly like, not you, no offense, but the, the <laughs> song itself sounds exactly like Mike Herrera at the beginning. Yeah. I thought for sure, like, this is a complete ripoff. Oh, oh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, this is, and this is probably more of a Poconecha song, I think. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's very, it's very, I mean, the, the lyrics to the first line are just an indignant, you don't know me, so that's not fair. Why does it matter how I sing or what I wear? And of course... We have the drums in the background going da 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 very awkwardly, <laughs> but this song does bring a little bit of attitude. Mm-hmm. It's not anything other than impotent whiny rage, but it brings attitude. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the lyrics, though. My first question is, who hurt these guys? <laughs> right. I mean, they're they're middle class white guys that go to a private Baptist high school. Right. Who who's giving these guys a hard time? I mean, maybe the teachers because they have spiky hair. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. So here, here is, I think this is the second verse. It's a shame to know your heart. Why do you act that way? Why do you think you're so smart? You're so confused to talk that talk. You can just go and take a hike on your blue and pink sidewalk. Don't try to judge me with your stupid lies. It's not at the outside, but what's inside. You're not listening to what I say. You're just going to judge me anyway. So first off, let's talk about the blue and pink sidewalk thing, which is, I don't know. No idea. Blue and pink. I mean, if you if you search the term blue and pink sidewalk, it's, this song comes up. Right. And I don't, I mean, blue, boys, pink, girl. Like, I was trying to think, what are these colors? I don't know. I don't think. I don't know. Based on the rest of the album, I doubt they gave it that much thought. I, w- I will say that I think blue and pink, if you look at sidewalk chalks, blue and pink are probably the two most popular colors. Okay, true. But I don't know what that means either. Yeah. <laughs> but don't try to judge me with your stupid lies. It's not the outside, but what's inside. You're not going to listen to what I say. You're just going to judge me anyway. So the subject of this song is being judged by quote unquote what's on the outside, right? Compare that to the supertones addressing this very similarly in Adonai. Those lyrics were, because we talked about this at the time. Right. I don't care about your haircut. Can't we all just get along? Not just get along, but to really love and care. If your eyes are on the Lord, you can't see nobody's hair. Now, this is obviously from the other's perspective, but I think it's interesting that the supertones approach this with grace and pocket, showing, pocket change just approaches it with anger. Maybe it's the difference between ska and punk. Yeah. But I don't know. It's just complainy. They don't offer a solution. They just complain about it. Right. Does that sound like a dad there? You don't come to me with a solution. You just come to me with complaints. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Anything else about this song? Uh, no. <laughs> All right. The last song on the album is On the Run. Mm-hmm. And it starts off not sounding like other songs. I want to give you my live notes as I listen to this. Feedback? Other noises? That isn't power notes played really fast. Holy shit, this almost sounds like a song that someone wrote. Quick, awkwardly bang on some snare drums really fast. No, no, we're getting real drumming. And palm muting? What? Is that a hi-hat? Where did this come from? (laughs) This is probably the most serious song on the album. Would you say that? Yeah, it's also one of the longest songs on the album. It is one of the longest songs on the album. (laughs) And not just because the secret song was at the end of it. Right. uh, Just on its own. Yeah. And I'm going to say that I think that this attempt at at a serious song from Pocket Change is rather successful. It's better. It feels like it was written by a far more mature band than most of the songs on the album. The vocalist seems to have accepted that for the most part he can't sing and he's writing songs around that now. And then at the end of the song, there's this talking verse, which is unexpected on my part. Yeah, it's kind of got that like old school punk rock spoken word thing yeah. going for it. Yeah. And at first I started to roll my eyes, but then he did it well, honestly. Yeah, it's not bad. I thought he kind of nailed it. 
there, it's not it's not super interesting song. There's still not anything to talk about because it's still just a pocket change song. But I think that this is probably the most successful song on the entire album. Just had to wade through all the other stuff to get to yeah. it. Yeah. The story of this album is that we got the songs in the chronological order they were written in. And when you get to the last one, you're like, guys, you're ready to write some songs for an album. <laughs> right. But one, one, I will say that once again, another thing that made this song successful, I think, is that the lyrics are actually personal. Except for the second verse, they're not just complaining about what other people are doing. True. And it's also, it also approaches, except for the second verse, it also uh, approaches, I think, a more serious and mature subject, which is how life just continues to move on and things change and it, is al- it isn't always fun. I don't know. I, th- I, thought, I thought it was, they don't have any answers for you in this song. It's just observing that life is hard and it keeps moving. And sometimes you just want to stay in a nice moment, but it, life just keeps moving on and you don't get that choice. I thought that was very nice. Yeah. If only the other songs could have been like this, right? <laughs> All right. Let's get to the hidden track here. So it's the, it starts off with this bass line that has, I think, kind of like this real country-ish feel. I wrote Yeehaw. It does, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's also kind of a fun feel. I think this song, much like the last song, shows a huge inva- advancement of songwriting. It makes me wonder, like, why is this a hidden track? You could have taken off Rest Assured and Behind a Wall and put this song in the regular part, and you would have had a better album. I think, I think a substantially better album. Yeah, I thought this song was better sounding. They kind of get a little bit like yelling with All I've Got. You know, and I think the only thing that makes it kind of hidden trackish is the way it ends with kind of that goofy ending. A little bit, but Goaty Hook did that all the time. Right. I mean, yeah, or you could just chop that off and, you know, not. Oh, you could, yeah, you could just not record it that way, of course. But right. even if you wanted to do it that way, Goaty Hook does it. So exactly. why not? You know, yeah. uh, lyrics, I think, are pretty, are pretty good. They're a little bit tongue in cheek, I think. Um, and it comes off pretty well. For example, the second verse is, I don't got no hobbies. I don't got no game. I don't like the same old stuff. I don't like my name. All I've got is Jesus. He, he helps my ICs. All I've got is Jesus. He's the one for me. I don't got no hobby. I don't got no game. I don't like the same old stuff. I don't like my name. All I've got is Jesus. He helps my ICs. All I want is Jesus. He's the one for me. All I've got. And it works pretty well. It's simple. It's not bashing other people over the head. And it, and it comes off as a good song. Right. So what's your, what's your big takeaway from this album, Jay? Well, I, I feel like it really, it's such a good uh, just time capsule of kind of the, the beliefs and the culture at that time. Mm-hmm. And I feel Very like, much. I mean, I, I wasn't in a band or anything like that, but if I had been and I'd been writing lyrics that I was, if I was writing lyrics, how do I put this the right way? That um, I expected other people to, I expected the church to be okay with, you mm-hmm. know, um, I might write these type of things. You know, this is just like exactly what you're expecting kind of the church culture to want to hear. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm not a fan of this album. I'm probably never going to listen to it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... In some ways, it has helped me rethink a lot of that stuff and think about it again, yeah. all the things that, you know, were kind of going on in the culture at the time. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's, it's honestly too much of that culture in one sitting. Yeah, it's a know? lot. We, we could never possibly talk about all the things that are going on in the culture that are reflected in this album. Yeah. Like a lot of the albums, I'll bring up Babies again, just because it's on my mind. Like it had that song, it touched on some stuff, but every mm-hmm. song wasn't like beating you over the head with it, where this right. one is like every song. Is there's yeah. stuff to pick apart in it. Yeah. And so I was in a band at this time. I mean, maybe not in 97, but by 98. And I did write the lyrics. And I was an asshole, but I never thought about writing lyrics like this. Like, I, I wrote actual personal lyrics. Yeah, I mean, I feel like some of their lyrics could just be like, 
<laughs> yeah, if they just turned it around and said, like, I'm struggling with this. Well, I, I'm also thinking like they could just be like rent a lyric or something like you could just pull <laughs> these out and use them for any style of Christian music at the time, you know? Yeah, <laughs> very true. Very true. On my first my first listen, I was very mean in my in my notes. A lot of critical things going on here. The second time I listened to it, I just listened to it more casually, just in the background while working. And I was honestly less offended by that, that maybe paying attention to this album is a bad idea. Yeah, if you, I'm kind of, a, yeah, like I'm a little opposite. The first time I was listening to it, I was doing something because I'd never heard them before. And I just wanted to yeah. kind of, you, and I wasn't really hanging on the lyrics. And so yeah. it wasn't so bad to me. And then when I dove in deep and started looking at the lyrics is when I was like, oh, <laughs> God. And, and while the lyrics are bad, to me, it's not even just that, because I think that a lot of my criticisms were even about the songwriting as far as my, my trope here of having that they, they do one interesting thing per song, you know, I was, that's, I, I, I was on that the, my first time through and it was really annoying me. But if you just listen to it casually, I think it's okay. It's okay. Background punk rock. But even then I would say that my original criticism still hold, you know, there, the lyrics as <laughs> are absolutely unforgivable, but I liked them as that when I was a 16 year old, but it's also listenable in the background. So uh, th I'm, I'm going to take a quote here from a, a review by the Phantom Toll Booth. They said, I'm tapping my foot. The songs aren't bad, but the band is, and the, and the band is fine on their instruments, but the tunes are not scratching me where I itch. I think that's very appropriate. Right. And I think that one thing that annoys me about this album is that, like I said earlier, that there's such a chasm between the, the, the better songs in this album and the worst songs in this album, that those better ones kind of they kind of piss you off because you see what they could have done if they just put out an EP or something. Right. These guys could have put out a really tight EP with this album if they were brave enough to do that. Good point. But like I said, in high school, I loved it and it was fun to listen to again. I'll say that. I kind of have a soft spot in my heart for messy punks that are just some kids trying to have fun. And I think there's good songs here and there's, but if they just left, left the bad, the worst ones off, they could have put out something stronger. So here's here's a question: Is this worse than Poconetcha? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I listen to Poconetcha a lot more, obviously. So maybe oh, that's yeah. part of it. Now I know that MXPX was in high school too when they did that album. So I think you can compare. I I also think the production on this there's something that drives me crazy, and like I said, maybe it's <laughs> the drums are too loud. Something yeah. I can't put my finger on it. It just doesn't sound like. It should. Poconacha doesn't sound great. I mean, no. it's not as good as some of their other albums, but I went back and listened to a few songs from that, trying to like see it. I, I, that one just sounds better to me too. Yeah. Even if there wasn't a good producer involved with Poconacha, I feel like MXPX could have walked into a, a studio and, and done a better job. Like they had a better understanding of what it took to get a good sound and those, those kind of things, you know, than these guys do. I think that these guys are okay songwriters. But I don't think they really have that understanding of what makes a good sound. Yeah. So you've already talked about their cover that you didn't think it was very impressive. Oh, um, yeah. I think it's, I, I'll just give my full opinion. I think it's terrible yeah. and it looks like something that like <laughs> I could do and I'd have no like graphic design skills uh -huh. whatsoever. Definitely. I, I, I said it's pretty simple, but you aren't going to miss it. Oh, that's true. And you could tell yeah. by looking at, I mean, I will say in like the Christian bookstore, you would see this and definitely probably think it's some kind of Christian punk band. Oh yeah, you know you yeah. you knew what this was when you looked at it. Yeah. So I have the album today that I bought just a few months ago, and it has a the cover basically. By the way, it says pocket change on the front with kind of like a broken up um, courier cut type font, typewriter type font, and it has a big tortoise on it. <laughs> right. And the copy I have has a blue background cover, but the copy I had in high school had a purple background cover. So there's two prints into this thing. I looked into it a little bit from what I could figure is that the blue one's probably the original and the purple one is, is, is printed for BMG. Uh, did you notice that it says punk with a purpose on the, uh, Oh yeah. And can we talk about some of these photos? Oh yeah. Let's do it. Um, yeah, it says punk with a purpose and there's a kind of a collage of photos all in black and white next to it. And I definitely see some other Christian band shirts. Um, there's mm -hmm. 90 pound was, I see overcome. There's a couple others I can't make out. I think one might be Strong Arm, which makes sense because this band really likes Strong Arm. But um, yeah, once again, these guys are obviously fans of the established Christian punk bands, right? <laughs> of the time, yes. It's interesting when you think about it. We kind of already have, and it's only '97. You already have like a second generation of yeah. Christian punk bands. 
Strange. Yep. It happened very, I mean, it's punk, so it happens very quickly. Because once again, all you need is some friends and some instruments and you can start writing songs. Yeah. <laughs> looking at these pictures, I don't feel like I'm looking at MXPX. I feel like I'm looking at my, my friends in a band playing a show. Yeah, that that's the thing. It just, the whole album just kind of seems kind of amateur, you know? Yes. And I, I don't know why. I mean, they, they obviously like, I think Liquid Disc who put this out, put out some other stuff that was like fairly big. I don't, I just, I don't know what happened. It's like they got somebody to do the artwork who didn't know anything about the style of music. I think the producer maybe mm-hmm. didn't. I don't know. It's just strange. Yeah, and I wrote the same thing. And, so, and I, I noticed in your notes that you talk about how messy the, 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 the lyrics are, for example, that there's misspellings. For example, one, at one time it says Gene, like G-E-N-E, when it should, yeah. it should be gu- Gunna. Right, and then you, you pointed out in that one song that we talked about. No, which one every song. That? No, the no, it, are... it, it screwed it up. Check it out, though. Look, it screwed it up in, was it for me? Um, yeah, for me, but then look at rest assured right under it. The apostrophes are correct. So huh. I don't know how somebody right. didn't just read through this once, but there's all kinds of errors, um, like noticeable huh. errors in the lyrics and stuff. And my, so my God is wrong. Yeah, I. I it's like but yeah, somebody, you're right. It's just ran, It's just completely random. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. So, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's yeah. I, so it it. I again. I don't. I'm curious about how this got put out and what happened because it seems like they did not take their time. And I, so I was going to talk about the recording quality here. That I, I, you know, I don't think it's horribly produced or recorded, but I do feel like you know. I don't know if the producer was phoning it in. Maybe something was going on in his family life. Maybe he just didn't understand punk, you know? Maybe he was like, no, it's supposed to be rough and, and, and trashy, you know? Well, here's but, the funny thing is I'm pretty <laughs> sure the guy who produced this, um, Steve Griffith, I think he was in The Altar Boys, which was one, kind of like one of their original <laughs> kind of Christian punk bands from the 80s. So, oh, now I don't know. Yeah, man, I don't know. Yeah, I will say that beyond the recording quality, one of the jobs of a, of a producer is to push the band with songwriting, songwriting, you know, and just say, OK, hey, I think you could leave, use some flourish here. I don't think he, right. he did that. I, I think that he felt. Yeah, no, band. it doesn't feel like anybody with any like felt yeah. like there was no help at all on this. Right. And the drums especially are horribly recorded. Yeah. Just horrible. Yeah. not just the drumming, which is not great. But the drum recording is just as bad as it can get. Again, I feel like I hear the cymbal way too much. I don't know. It's something in this is not, yeah. not right. So um, where are they now, Clifton? Yeah, so these guys, uh, they played Cornerstone at least twice, maybe three times. As we just talked about, they released another album called Wake Up, Not Screaming, Just Wake Up. Uh, you know, so I haven't listened to it. I have read that it's probably better than this. You said that you've listened to a song. It's just, it's just, a, little, it's just a better punk. Yeah. Um, I've also read that it's hardcore, but that wasn't your experience with the one song you heard. Uh, they broke up in 2001 after an attempted lineup expansion, uh, choosing to pursue their education instead. In 2005, Tim released a documentary called Pocket Change, Out of the Box and Onto the Screen, but I can't find anything about it. If you, if you search that, you only pull up the Wikipedia article that says that it exists. Um, I did find in the Wayback Machine that at one point there was a teaser trailer, but it doesn't exist anymore. I also tweeted at Tim, asked him about the documentary, but he has not responded. I'd love to watch it. If anyone knows anything about that, let us know. And today, Tim seems to be in marketing, and the other two guys have really common names, and I don't know. There we go. This is also, I will say, this is another one of those bands that there is a lot of bands called Pocket Change. Yes. Which made trying to find information on them very difficult.
So Clifton, what are we listening to next time? We are going to listen to Dakota Motor Company's Welcome Race Fans. I have good memories of that. I don't know if I'll feel <laughs> the same way uh, after re-listening to yeah. it, but in my mind, I have positive thoughts. So we'll see. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of Your Music Saved Us. If you enjoyed your time with us, please leave us a review or share this episode on the social media of your choice, where you can probably find us at Your Music Saved Us, or email us at yourmusicsavedus at gmail.com. The music in this episode is the work of Pocket Change and is used with apologies, not permission. And that includes yes. the other Pocket Change song by the other Pocket <laughs> Change group that we've played a brief clip of as well. I, uh, I can't find that this or really any other pocket change stuff is for sale anywhere. Uh, so, other than you CDs, I guess. So, if anyone knows how to get a hold of that documentary, let us know. I'd love to listen to it and get the word on how other people can watch it. Um, I don't know how to support these guys now, though. So, uh, I don't know. Send them send good vibes their way. Yep. All right. Thank you, guys. Because I did, I did go back and listen to this without once again without the lyrics. They're pretty easy to remove on this album, by the way, because they're the only thing in that in that register. Um, and it's it's the same amount of boring. I was gonna say that I I don't know if this you could stand it without them. I'm sure it almost sounds the exact same. But I wonder what song you're on. You know, you don't know what song you're. On.